Morning all. I'd like to talk about Alan Turing this morning. He made remarkable contributions to computer science, um, Second World War efforts, uh, computer chess, artificial intelligence in general. He questioned things. If we look at the Albert Einstein quote, just to remind you about questioning, Albert Einstein said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. If you look at the Turing Digital Archive, back back in the 50s Turing had some amazing fundamental questions uh, not just about how computer chess programs worked but also the Turing test which is used around the internet today to stop bots registering at forms the Turing test was one of the sub questions that Turing had when he was questioning if computers could play chess I'll give you the Turing digital archive link in the description of this video I really recommend you check that out you'll see the fundamental questions he asked one, could one make a machine which would obey the rules of chess, uh, you know, to play legal moves? Two, could one make a machine to solve chess problems, uh, like a force mating free? Could one make a machine which could play a reasonably good game of chess when confronted with ordinary positions, not unusual, you know, like mating uh, five positions, mating free? And question four, this, this generated some sub questions. Could one make a machine to play chess and to improve its play game by game, profiting from its experience? And then here are the sub questions. So here's the Turing test. Could one um, coming up? Could one make a machine which would answer questions put to it in such a way that it would not be possible to distinguish its answers from those of a man? So we have today Catcher, um, completely automated public Turing test for telling computers and humans apart. It's used on all the registration forms. You know where you have to write letters. That comes from Alan Turing, the Turing test. And this is one of his sub-questions to question four, which you can see in the digital archive. Uh, you know, so this, this relates the Turing test. Um, question um, six, could one make a machine which would have feelings like you and I do? So then he goes about to answer those questions, but I really recommend you know you check that out in this little archive. Fascinating stuff, absolutely fascinating. Also, I want to mention. I think Bill Gates one, once mentioned the beauty of programs. I can't find the exact quote. Was that is that a repeatability? And um, I will be showing you a game of Turing where he's actually using his own program. So you'd expect that game to be repeatable if the opponent played exactly the same moves you'd expect repeatability as well now he didn't actually have a computer to run his program on so he was spending 30 minutes each move on paper and pencil working out the answer from the program he had developed if you the timeline for for computer chess programs just to put this in a broader context we've seen the turk uh, uh, a sort of automation uh, in a previous video, it was a bit of a hoax. It was one of the greatest hoaxes uh, in, in the period, not 1769. 1868, we have the Ajib automation, which also had a, a human player inside. 1912, we had a machine which could play king and rook versus king and games. So that's uh, very, very interesting. Someone apparently built, built a machine, Leonardo Torres Converto. That would be interesting to check out as well. 1948, so we're approaching this era. Norbert Winner's book, Cybernetics, describes how a chess program could be developed using a depth-limited mini-max search with an evaluation function. That's 1948. 1950, okay, coming up to Alan Turing very shortly, Claude Shannon publishes Programming computers, Computer for Playing Chess one of the first papers on the problem of computer chess. Now in 1951, so here we are, Alan Turing, he develops on paper the first program capable of playing a full game of chess. Now I guess this, this may have had en passant, um, you know, and other all the stuff under promotions. Did it really handle that? Well, we'll see what it did handle from the game example. But um, check out the Turing Digital Archive and um, just uh, to un underpin uh, this, his, his uh, program here, it started in, in concept in 1948. He was working with his former undergraduate college, a colleague, uh, Champernel. So he began writing it apparently in 1948. In 1949, okay, that, that was Claude Shannon's paper. So in 1950, he started writing it. 
and he proposed the Turing test as well. Okay, so in 1951, he tried to implement the TurboChamp program on the Ferranti Mark I computer at Manchester University. He never completed that task. Okay, but um, his his uh, colleague Dietrich Prinz uh, wrote a, a chess program for the Ferranti that sold mate in twos. So that was one of his questions that he'd ask about you know the mate problem, uh, and that program. That first program ran in November 1951, so it would examine every possible move until a solution was found. It took about 15 minutes to solve a mate in two. So in 1952, and this is this is the kind of outrageous thing, lacking a computer powerful enough to execute the program that he devised, so he actually simulated the computer taking half an hour per move. And we're going to look at the game now. Okay. It was recorded. It, um, I'm not going to give away the result. So it was against his colleague, Alec Glenny. Let's have a look at the game. So you know now the circumstances behind this game. E4. Yeah, so I guess played after half an hour. Or may, maybe, I don't know, maybe for E4 he, he just played it immediately. E5. So Alan Turing White, Alec Glenny, Black. Knight C3 was played by the computer. So if you look at the rules for choosing a move, he had actually quantified uh, not just material count but positional evaluation, believe it or not, using square roots. If you look at the Turing archive, and, and also king safety is factored in, just, just quantifying king safety. So the computer is able to distinguish you know, positions being, being good or bad depending you know, on these basic heuristics, uh, you know, rules of thumb. Uh, and the heuristics uh, are quantifying even positional play and material and king safety. So knight f6 and the computer decides d4 is a good move. Probably, you know, it liberates the bishop probably on its evaluation function. The scope of the piece is increased with d4 and it's not losing material. Bishop b4, now knight f3. Okay, creating more scope for the knight than it is on g1. It's got more scope, so maybe these all fulfill the simple heuristics that the program had. Okay, so after d6, uh, we see bishop d2. Actually, let's, let's just make a quick note here. Um, why isn't knight takes e4 possible? Well, um, the e5 pawn in return, but uh, w w maybe we should check this out in the second pass. But d6 was played. And now bishop d2 unpinning. Okay. And you might still ask about bishop takes c3 and knight e4 here. Let's not get too pedantic on the chess point of view. It's just the basic heuristics being used on this program. Very interesting. Knight c6. And the program plays d5. It's like it wants to munch a knight. Knight d4. And now h4 is played. That does extend the scope of the rook. Okay. Uh, of course it weakens g4, bishop g4. And now the other rook is extended in the scope with a4. <laughs> okay, this is slightly odd at the moment. Knight takes f3 check and the and the program does capture back. His program worked out being he's been working out simulating the computer itself which hasn't been built yet. So bishop b5 check c6 and now d takes c6 is played. Okay, and after castles again, using just the material uh, evaluator, c takes b7 is played. And now after rook b8, protecting the pawn with bishop a6. So queen a5 is played, and his virtual program does manage to find queen e2, protecting the bishop, which is now also, of course, protecting that pawn. Knight d7. And then we see rook g1 and it looks as though that might be triggered by a king safety evaluation part of um, his heuristics as well as scope scope and king safety to play rook g1 uh, so knight c5 which does attack the bishop and then we see a counter attack on the opponent's bishop first before moving that bishop 
Okay, bishop g6 is played. And now that bishop's moved, it was attacked by queen and knight. Okay, giving back that pawn, knight takes b7. And he did, apparently, I assume, program in for castling queenside and kingside, as this demonstrates, castling queenside. Okay, in principle, maybe it's not a good idea because uh, the king, the queen side is already being weakened. From a chess point of view, okay, we can look and say, yeah, yeah, the queen side looks a bit dangerous. But the computer's got to quantify every decision it's making. So it just thinks based on its heuristics and not, not thinking, I think two ply ahead, I think was the original thing as well, using the heuristics. Not more than that. I think he'd, to simulate that, he would be, you know, he'd probably take more than half an hour. So I assume he's working on the two ply, which is two half moves ahead each time as well, using the very basic heuristics. So knight c5. Now bishop c6 is concluded from his calculations. Rook fc8. And again, protecting Matil, bishop d5. But now the onslaught, of course, visually, it, it looks like a huge onslaught on, on the poor white king here. We can say that, and, and there's no real prospects at the moment for an attack on, on the black king. So bishop takes c3, def removing a defender. Queen takes a4. So the king's in trouble, and the king makes a run for it. So king d2 is decided as a good course of action. I think he had factored in the possibilities of queens next to kings, if you look at the digital archive. So king d2 maybe just improves king safety from the computer's point of view. Computer inverted commas working it out. So knight e6. Okay, rook g4 protecting the material against the knight g5. Knight d4 attacking the queen. The queen moves to d3 and also protects c2 there. Knight b5 putting more pressure on on the queen side. The player with black doesn't seem such a bad player <laughs> actually. So bishop b3, queen a6, bishop c4, um, bishop h5 attacking the rook, the rook moves. Queen a4 att attacking uh, the bishop, the bishop takes on b5. Queen takes b5. And now blunder, so maybe because of the limit of two moves ahead, that the computer decides to, his program decided queen takes d6. So it wasn't particularly strong. And after rook d8, um, he resigned on behalf of his computer. Um, so you might think, well, did it actually beat anyone uh, with this um, two-move-ahead approach? Apparently, um, according to a, a, so, some sources I researched, them, it apparently won a game against uh, Champenelle's wife, uh, but that's, that hasn't been recorded. Okay, but the Turing test, as well as, as one of his questions, you know, it's it's just majorly influential on on the current state of things and, and obviously his, his computer program they developed into, into being able to beat all the grandmasters of the world. And at the time in in his digital archive he questions whether you know pe people assume that you can't build something that is better than yourself and he creates this kind of argument well ca can, can an animal eat something larger than itself? I think some snakes can, can eat <laughs> things larger than themselves but anyway he he did uh say that uh with increasing speed there's no there's no question about it that it could eventually um beat humans just increasing the speed and that was that's related to um so computers really didn't need to learn much from from a particular game they, i think they so already he knew that uh, you know speed would be um, a major factor for this this way of of working uh that computers can just get stronger through hardware, if nothing else. Even if the, even if the software didn't improve, but um, the software did improve, hardware did improve, and, and nowadays, you know, computers are, are much stronger than, than humans. Um, okay, so I'm not actually really sure we should do a second pass through this game. But I, what I really want you to get from this video is, you know, check out the Turing Digital Archive. This this video is just a pointer to some other resources, which I'll put in the description of the video and I hope you found it slightly interesting uh, to see this game which you know, he was basically simulating his own computer which hadn't been built uh, quite remarkably. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.